so thank you very much. Um, I am extremely grateful to Jens, to the society, to this museum, to Goethe's uh, Institute, and to Hubert Schmidtleitner, and also the very professional team in this museum, to have made it possible today to show um, an experience that Goethe made in 1777, in December, when he was climbing down the mountains of Harz in northern Germany in the snow. And um, I want to first describe what he observed, and then I want to tell you what I plan to do with that. And um, he, was, he was coming down from the highest mountain in Harz, it's a thousand meters high, it was snow covered, and during the whole climbing down, he saw blue shadows in the snow. And um, it got a little darker, the sun got orange, and the snow was put into an orange um, color. And at that moment, the um, shadows turned a little violet, and then the sun was going down, and you had a purple light everywhere on the snow, and all the objects that threw shadows made a green shadow. And this is the green shadow that some of you can already see here on the left side on the screen. And after the lecture, you are invited to enter this field of vision and to create your own green shadows as you march through the scene. And what's interesting about this production of the green shadow um, is that there's no green light around. We have a white screen and then we have an imitation of the purple light of the sun, which comes from um, some lamp here, in front of which there's a purple foil. And the purple foil makes an overall impression in this room and on that white screen of a light, gentle purple. And the shadow um, is made by your eye. So the green isn't here physically, say the physicists, okay, say the physicists. And I find it a very striking experience. Goethe had it when he marched down. He saw his own green shadow, although there was no green at all in the surroundings. And Goethe was absolutely st uh, struck by this experience. And I believe that this was in 18, uh, 1777, the moment at which he decided to study scientifically colors, light, and darkness. And I don't know how much it is known outside Germany, but in Germany we know that, um, it's knowledge from high school, let us say, that in his attempt of doing color science, he failed as bad as one can fail. So um, we get it described like that Goethe, the poet, tried to do physics but couldn't do it. And what happened was that the greatest German phys uh, poet attacked the most important British physicist, Newton. And Goethe believed that he could um, wipe away, scientifically, the theory of colors that had been established already for 100 years. This is typically described to be a complete crazy project which was doomed to fail. And that's how I learned in school as well. Um, and I believe everybody in Germany who doesn't go to Waldorf school learns it like that. <laughs> and um, quite a while ago, I um, was told by people that in philosophy I should do some historical work. I shouldn't always work on present philosophy. So I decided to take this theory of color, take it seriously as a piece of physics, and then um, smash it with modern means. So I wanted to destroy it. So I took the thousand pages which Goethe wrote about colors to the vacation, and I took a little prism to my pocket, and then I started reading. In the beginning, um, it's difficult to understand what the guy is after. Um, and on uh, page 50, he describes the color shadows, and it's beautiful and poetic, but one doesn't quite see what the point is against Newton here. And then you read on and on, and if you are willing to enter into his language, which is at the same time clear and very strong and powerfully poetic, um, 
you come at a description of some experiments which are absolutely striking and which don't show up in school lessons and also not in the university, which when I first read about them, I believed they cannot be true. And then I tried it with my little prism and I saw that he was right. And at that moment, it made suddenly click. And I saw with a sudden awareness what the main critique of Goethe against Newton's color the theory was and that it can be defended with modern means. And I want to share this with you today. To connect it a little to uh, today uh, in the morning, the keynote, um, Brigitte said um, that the biologists don't want their fixed ontologies challenged, right? And I tell you, when you challenge the fixed ontologies of physicists, they get ever more mad than the biologists. So the physics, physicists believe that, for example, the light phenomena are made up uh, of photons. And what I want to do today is, in the end of my talk, to give a hint as to how one might deconstruct the ontology of green photons. So deconstructing green was, after all, the subject of all this undertaking here, and I'm going to do it with a fierce attack a la Goethe against photons. So let us now um, first have a short look into what Newton said about the colors. So what we all know from high school is what Newton did. He um, darkened his room by way of closing the window shutters, drilled a little hole into the window shutter, shutter F, and it was a sunny day, rare as they are in England. And if you don't have a prism in the way of the light, you would see an elliptic white shape, the projection of the sun on the floor of the darkened chamber. But Newton put a prism in the way of the light, and as one knew back then already, um, that light is bent or refracted when it travels through some media borders. And in this case, the straight light of the sun um, is um, redirected. It doesn't go straight down to the floor of the dark chamber, but it's refracted twice so that the light ends up on the opposite wall. What Newton expected is that he would have a round image of the sun, white. But what he saw was an elongated spectrum in the rainbow colors. Up there it's blue, in the middle it's green, and down it's red. And this was a thing he wanted to explain. He came up with his theory, which we now still learn in school, which is that the white light consists of differently colored lights. Nowadays we would say different photons. Some of the light rays which make up the white light are very strongly refrangible, which means that they are most strongly changing their path when, when traveling through the prism. So they end up on top of the image. These are the blue and violet lights. They want to be changing their way through the prism as much as possible. While the green rays have the tendency of being refracted um, in an intermediate way, and the red light is refracted the least. So the prism disentangles the um, different rays, which are all the time in the white light. White light isn't um, homogeneous, says Newton, but heterogeneous, consisting of all these colors. There is a hidden assumption in Newton's claim here, and the assumption is that the darkness of the dark chamber in which it is all organized doesn't matter. The darkness, according to Newton, is nothing. The darkness is not causally relevant for the experiment, which is why Newton needs this darkness as a stage, a neutral stage on which the whole thing is running. This is not an innocent assumption, because before Newton entered the game, the physicists believed that the colors derive from the interplay of darkness and light. And Newton wiped away a tradition of 1.5 thousand years when he showed up and claimed that black and darkness is nothing. That's what we still believe today, and I want to challenge that. To show you a little how much coincidence was involved when Newton showed up with that um, experiment, I want to um, say that it is quite um, special that Newton was interested in astronomy and he was bothered by the low quality of telescopes of his days. 
The telescopes were with glass lenses, and you had what's called chromatic aberration. So when you watch um, some white object like this king here, through a lens or through a prism, the different um, rays which are coming through the prism are refracted differently so that the edges of this chess king are blurred and you can't get them sharp. You have some colors. The colors are disturbing. And Newton, being interested in astronomy, was angry at the disturbance of white light spots at the dark sky of the night. And that's why he was interested in the spectrum which um, shows up when you uh, have something white in a black surrounding. The black surrounding is a background and the white is what interests you. Now suppose Newton hadn't been interested in astronomy, but suppose he had been a biologist working with microscopes, not looking at the white stars at the sky, but at little insects in the white surrounding. That's how biologists look through the microscope. You have, for example, a little louse. And when you have a little louse and you look through the microscope on it, you also get spectral colors, but other spectral colors. So that if Newton had been a biologist, he would not have set it up such that the surroundings would be black and the object to be looked at would be white, but it would be the other way around. That's why I have here um, chess queen black, where you also see some colors which blur the clarity of the image. And now if you follow this a little more methodologically, then you can see what are the circumstances of the colors. So suppose you have some white object up there on my picture in a black surrounding and you send this through the prism. Then you get this beautiful rainbow spectrum which is beneath it. And it is the spectrum that we all know from high school. Suppose you do it the other way around. Suppose you have a white background and a black object like it is down there in my projection and you send this through the prism, you get also a spectrum. Equally beautiful as uh, the original one, equally big, equally colorful, but with totally different colors. So if Newton had been a biologist and not an astronomer, he might have started his investigation of optics with the spectrum down there. And the interesting, shocking thing is that you can do all the optics that Newton did in this paradigm. You can make it with much more light than he did. He works in the darkness, but you can do the same story isomorphically, as we mathematicians say, in the bright. Now, um, to show a little uh, what this amounts to, so what, what do the experiments look, look like when you do this systematically, you could, for example, in the left hand, do it uh, in the Newton style, so you have your prism up there, and then a white beam of light comes through the prism and it is um, split up into the colors. And if instead of um, sending a white beam of light in a black surrounding through the prism, you do it the other way around, then you must open the window shutter and the prism must be lit completely. And then you need a little, little shadow which goes through the prism. And the diameter of the shadow must be exactly the same diameter as the diameter of the light that Newton used. If you set it up like that, you could, for example, take the little tiny, wait, little, tiny wooden um, object that fell down when Newton cut the hole into the window shutter, the wooden piece, you, you take it and you glue it on the prism. It is has then the same diameter as the original hole, and if you do that, you get an extremely nice um, new experiment with complementary colors. There's other ways to imagine this. So what you could also do, what we do here is you sort of invert the aperture, right? And originally you have a hole, that's your aperture, which we know from cameras. But instead of the aperture, uh, aperture um, like a hole, you make it um, an opaque round object and you get the opposite spectrum. Instead, you could do something much more drastic, which is only a thought experiment, because we can't um, gamble with the sky. But suppose the sky would be inverted. So suppose you would have a little blue sun, as our sky is blue, and the rest of the sky would be as hot and as bright as is the sun now. So the, the, the sky is switched. If 
that was the situation, and it is a co coincidence that this is not the situation now. If that was the situation, then we would also have started with the spectrum which is down there. And now come to think about it, when God made the universe and when she said, let there be light, she didn't say how much light was to be made. She could have made much more light than she actually did with the same natural laws. And if God had started like that, we would have started with the spectrum to the right. This is, I would say, a perfectly reasonable starting point for optics. And Goethe came up in the color theory in this two uh, in this uh, 1,400 pages book with one drastic empirical claim. The claim is this. Take any experiment which Newton made and switch systematically in the experiment the roles of bright and white and blackness. So wherever in the experiment it was bright, you, put it, you do it black, and wherever it was black, you make light. Right? You just switch the roles. It's a mathematical operation that you just symmetrically switch the roles of darkness and light. And Goethe made the claim that whichever experiment of Newton you take, you get then, with this operation, a new experiment, and the result will be always in complementary colors. Newton made hundreds of experiments. And we could, oper oper we could, we could do this um, to, to understand a little better what this is the logic here, what we could do is, we could photograph Newton's experiment, and then we put it to our computer and um, press the color inversion button, right? Then you get a new picture. And Goethe's prediction says that this new picture shows you an outcome of an actual experiment which really can be performed. This is a very bold claim, and nobody took it seriously much till a few people um, started trying it out. In Goethe's times, it was not possible to try it out much because you need a lot of artificial light. Think about it. You have a dark chamber, and the dark chamber should be completely bright. What you would need, ideally, is white walls surrounding your equipment, white walls which shine from all possible directions as smoothly as also the dark chamber um, makes everything very smoothly unified and black. So to do this, um, Goethe had no chances, there was no electrical light back then, but nowadays one can do it. And we repeated all the experiments of Newton's that were most important to him, and all of them could be done in this opposing manner. That's a bit shocking, because um, if you um, take it a coincidence with which of the two settings you start, Newton being a biologist or an astronomer, then it looks like that we could start a new way of doing optics, which one could call the theory of the darkness, and which would claim that darkness consists of all these complementary colors, and that white light is nothing, is absent um, darkness. And the interesting thing is that this new theory can be pushed quite, quite far. I was surprised. I thought that it will collapse rather quickly. I worked now for 15 years on it, and I have not yet found the point where this collapses, where the symmetry gets ruined. And that's interesting, because now we have suddenly two theories which um, equally well go with the data. Let me just, in order to make you not too nervous, add that Newton's theory can explain these other spectra. It's no problem. What you do is you say, no, 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 no. It's not the shadow that goes through the prism. It is the light which goes around it and goes through the prism. And this light is quite chaotically refracted and it mixes the Goethe spectrum in a complicated manner. And if one analyzes this in detail, it turns out that, for example, the purple middle of the spectrum of Goethe is consisting of all um, sorts of light with the exception of the green ones. So there's some logic behind it. But the very same logic can be turned the other way around. You can also start with Goethe's counter theory. Then you claim that um, all the colors are slumbering in the dark. And in order to explain the green middle of Newton's spectrum, then you say it is all these colors minus the purple. And as the situation experimentally is totally symmetric, there is no reasonable way to decide between these two theories. 
Newton claimed to be able to prove his theory, and that is what Goethe found um, the toughest failure of Newton. Now we have two theories, and they equally well agree with the data, and they're equally simple, they're equally economic, and they have an entirely different ontology. Suddenly there's no photons anymore, but let me say dark, dark particles in the colors yellow, purple, and turquoise. While well, before we had photons that were, for example, green. And what one sees now when I speak about deconstructing green, then we can say, well, um, the, exactly the green doesn't exist according to the counter theory, because there is no green in the new spectrum. As much as traditionally we are being told in school that there is no purple in the world, and that the purple is made only by our eyes, namely a superposition of blue and red. As much as uh, orthodox physics attacks the purple of not existing in reality, as much Goethe can say that the green doesn't exist in reality, and I think that's the contribution to deconstructing green, right? Now let us um, go a little more into the um, uh, surrounding science of that time. Was it crazy when Goethe came up with this? Well, yes, it was crazy because Newton's theory was established already for 100 years, and it is always crazy to try a revolution against something which exists already for 100 years. While, of course, from time to time a revolution is needed. Now Goethe had some extra evidences which made it appear much less crazy than it appears at first sight to make this attack on Newton's theory. And this is that um, Goethe believed that the whole realm of nature, that all phenomena were organized by what he called polarity. Polarity means that you have two opposing factors which are acting against one another and which create an enormous abundance of phenomena. And the talk of polarity was, in Goethe's days, very much the avant-garde of natural sciences. So, for example, at the time at which Goethe started these investigations, they had, they had known already the polarity of magnetism. So you have uh, two magnets here, and if opposing poles are put close to one another, you get some attracting forces, right? And polarity means that if you switch the role of two poles, then you get the opposite result. So that when you um, turn around the magnet down there, the attracting forces will be switched into repulsion forces. So polarity means you switch some poles. First you identify two poles which are opposing, and then you switch them. And this um, switches the result, turns the result into opposite. And what Goethe did with the colors was very similar. He switched the role of the darkness pole and of the white pole. And then, as a result, also the effects were uh, the opposite, namely the complementary colors of what was there before. Purple is a complementary color to green, as you will be able to explore there later. And uh, yellow is uh, complementary to blue and so forth. So Goethe's spectrum is complementary to Newton's. And the very same structure emerged here. You switch the poles and you get opposite effects. It wasn't only then magnetism that one knew this. This is from 1600. But um, quite a few years before Goethe did his color research, the Swedish chemist Bergman um, experimented with the beautiful precious stones, tourmalines, that had at that moment arrived Europe, in Europe. And what he found out is that one can um, impose electrical poles on these tourmalines which is when you heat up the tourmaline, or the two tourmalines, then you can see that um, each of them exhibit a plus pole and a minus pole. So if you then um, arrange the tourmalines like these magnets before, in one um, position they will um, repulse one another, and if you switch the direction of one of the tourmalines, then they will attract one another electrically. And that was the very moment when they started to speak in chemistry and physics of electrical poles. So they transferred the metaphors of magnetic poles on electricity because of this experiment. But in this experiment, there was more to be done still because Bergman found out that um, if instead of heating up the tourmaline, you cool it down, 
so you do the opposite thermodynamical thing with the tourmaline, then the poles are again switched. So that made people believe that there's a polarity between cold and warm. Which, of course, nowadays we believe to be nonsense. Nowadays we believe that warm is energy and coldness is absence of warm, right? That's how we are taught in school. But at the time at which these experiments were made, the people weren't so sure about it. And let me describe you quickly a little beautiful experiment which was done by Lord Rumford around that year, 1780, or something like that. So what he did is this. He took um, a mirror, um, how's it called, parabolic mirror, mirror? I forget now, maybe. Parabolic, hmm? parabolic mirror here. And uh, there were, it is the center, um, I don't know how it's called. The, yeah. Um, he put a thermometer and then symmetrically to it he had another parabolic mirror here. And here he lit a match. And immediately the thermometer went up because the heat radiation went from the match onto the mirror and then they were parallel and here they were beamed into this one spot where the thermometer was. So this was the detection of heat radiation, okay? And then Lord Rumford switched the tables and instead of litting a match there, he put an ice cube and the thermometer dropped. Which made Lord, Lord Rumford say that there is cold radiation as much as there is heat radiation. And it took quite a number of decades to get rid of this. Now we believe this is nonsense, but back then it was avant-garde science. In the same manner, Goethe wanted to go on with the investigation of the spectra. And he spoke about cold colors and warm colors. So now, now he transported the um, opposition of warm and cold, known from electricity, um, into an opposition in the realm of colors. Up there you have the cool colors, down there you have the warm ones. And then some sh something shocking happened. A British guy, um, and at the same time a German composer, Herschel, um, made measurements in the Newtonian spectrum. And what he did is this. He um, organized the whole thing as usual in a dark chamber, and he put the thermometer in the blackness of the dark chamber far away from the spectrum in position one. It was more outside, right? And he measured the room temperature. And when the thermometer wasn't moving anymore, he put it into the center of the Newton spectrum and the temperature grew. So this was the moment where you could see that light rays have the power to warm the thermometer. Then he put it for position two from the green into the position three, the red, and the thermometer grew stronger. And then, surprise, surprise, he put the thermometer in position four. There where you don't see light anymore. And there was the maximum of temperature. That was the detection of infrared light. Now, the physicists surrounding Goethe were quite nervous about it. Because Herschel was not able to detect any temperature effects up there in the blue, the turquoise, and outside the blue in the ultraviolet. They got nervous because Goethe had said that there's a polarity in the spectra, and if there's a polarity, you wouldn't accept the asymmetry that on the one side the spectrum goes further, and on the other side it doesn't, right? And uh, it happened so that um, a young, genius, talented physicist named Ritter was in very close relationship with Goethe at that time, and he wanted to help Goethe, I believe, and prove that there's also on the other side of the spectrum some effect. And voila, he found the ultraviolet light there with Goethe's method of believing in a deep symmetry and polarity within the spectrum. That was as much um, valuable as the detection of the infrared light. He didn't do it with a thermometer, but with photochemistry, but I don't want to bother you with the details because the story goes on quite interestingly. This was in 1801. Um, just one day after Ritter had detected this in Jena, he went through the winter to Goethe in order to explain it to him. On a, that day on which they met, there was good weather. So I believe that he showed this experiment Goethe, and Goethe was probably the second person who saw the ultraviolet light, or ultraviolet rays, I should better say. And um, Goethe immediately proposed that one should do much more experiments to still 
deepen the symmetry and polarity photochemically and thermodynamically with the spectra and asked Ritter if he could do that for him. And Ritter did it, and in the summer 1801, Ritter found um, a many symmetries in the light which made him believe that Newton is finally repudiated and Goethe is right in the end. Then, at that moment at which he wanted to show this to Goethe, um, Goethe and Ritter quarreled. We don't know about what the quarrel was, but we know that the cooperation of the two of them stopped rather harshly. And it happens so that at that very day of the quarrel, a young promise, promising Danish physicist visited Ritter. They met there for the first time at the very same day, Ørsted. And Ørsted, I believe, was told by Ritter what the phenomena were and how they looked like and so on. And um, Ørsted caught fire and he had already before believed in the polarity in nature because he had read Kant and in Kant's work it is also emphasized. And with this knowledge he had come to Germany and with that he met Ritter and Ritter spoke about the polarity in the spectra. So Ørsted was quite fond of these ideas as well. Now Ørsted traveled to Paris papers into French, and the French were very much amazed by the ultraviolet experiments, but some other experiment, which also was supposed to show some polarity, failed badly and ruined Ritter's and also for quite a while Orsted's um, reputation. That was a sad incident. Um, and what they wanted to prove back then in the Paris Academy in 1803 was that electricity and magnetism belong together, that they are more or less similar not only two um, phenomena which are both organized with polarities, but that the polarities interact with one another. And as I said, um, Ørsted was unable to reproduce Ritter's experiments in France, and um, the two of them were ridiculed for quite some time. But that's not where the story ends, because um, 17 years later, Ørsted uh, did detect the interaction between magnetism and electricity. So he put a little magnetic needle next to some current, uh, electrical current, and the needle suddenly moved um, to the other direction. And that was the biggest success Ørsted made. I would say all this was perfectly normal science back then. Goethe wasn't crazy. It was avant-garde methodology then to look out actively for polarities in quite many domains of phenomena and to connect them, to connect electricity with magnetism, temperature and photochemistry with spectra and so on. And the very idea after which all these scientists were striving was the unity of nature, just one formula which uh, explains it all in a sophisticated manner. I believe that's what physicists do nowadays still. So um, it wasn't something crazy. It was not a method where you temper around with lousy experiments and don't bother about the details and so on. But it was a very precise kind of work, which I would say at that time was um, to be defended. Now, of course, nowadays, um, we would um, still be skeptical about some of these things. So I believe what we nowadays say is that on the one hand, electricity and magnetism is organized according to polarities. We speak still of plus and minus poles and magnetic north and south poles, so far so good. But with respect to temperature and with respect to darkness, we believe that the very idea of polarity failed there. And now, um, what we would say nowadays as a very scientific objection is that neither coldness nor darkness exist. They are nothing but absence of warmth and of light. That's how we believe it nowadays. And this very claim I would like to challenge now. So on the one hand, I would like to share with you some game which I made a while ago with a physicist, famous physicist at that, which was this. Um, I said that we can use Goethe's theory still to um, make more predictions and get polarity results. So Goethe had asked Ritter to make um, temperature measurements in the complementary spectrum. Ritter didn't do it, he didn't have time for it. Um, and um, I was just wondering what would we expect if now we put the thermometer first in the bright room in which the Goethe spectrum lives, in the position one, and wait till the thermometer shows a temperature there, and what would happen when we then move it into the middle, purple middle of the Goethe spectrum? 
Now, as I have explained, switching the poles, for example, of darkness of light and light should create opposite effects, right? So what one expects is, I would say, according to Goethe, that the temperature drops in the Goethe spectrum. And when you go further from the purple center to the turquoise end of the Goethe spectrum, I would have expected that the thermometer will drop still further. And if you go outside the Goethe spectrum, I expect that it gets the minimum temperature there in what one could call the infra cyan coldness radiation. And about this prediction, I had a bet with a famous physicist. And I'm glad to say that I won that bet. It goes on, it goes like that, and here's the measurements with a very fine thermometer. You see the symmetry. Everything is as it should have been according to polarity talk. Still, of course, no physicist believes that the Goethe spectrum is as fundamental as is Newton's. Everybody thinks that Newton's spectrum shows um, photons. So in the middle of the Newton spectrum, you have the green photon. And the green photon has quite a defined wavelength, and this makes it a green photon. There are green photons. And there are no purple darkness pieces, right? That's what physics tells us. And now, um, anarchistically minded as I am in my old age, um, I wonder why don't we have in our physics purple photons? Why isn't there such a thing? It could be because they aren't there. Ontology would be something super fixed then. As a physicist found out the true ontology, maybe not in, in biology, it's maybe more difficult, it's more queer there, but in physics it should be robust, right? In physics should have a, a clearly objective, identifiable ontology. That's why there aren't purple darkness pieces, one might say. But there could be also another reason why there aren't, why we don't know about purple darkness pieces or particles, right? And um, I believe that is a true reason. The reason why we don't know about them is that up to now we haven't looked for them. If the polarity idea which Goethe pushed and which I have tried to explain reasonably tonight, if this idea um, is as strong as I believe it to be, it predicts that it should be possible to produce purple particles. And the pur purple particles that are not heterogeneous, but homogeneous, with one identifiable uh, property, the color purple. And now um, I must tell you, please wait a couple of years till we have identified them. Um, we have had a Ritter workshop in Berlin just three weeks ago, and there were quite a few nice physicists, and there were orthodox physicists, theoreticians and experimentalists. And um, after the papers, we were sitting in the pub and had quite some nice food and enough wine. <laughs> and um, it turned out that the experimentalist and the theoretician agreed that it is possible, according to modern quantum mechanics, to produce the purple particles. And that will be my next project. I want to see them, right? It will be difficult to make them. I need quite some money to get it done and so on. But what I want to uh, tell you now is that the search for the symmetry, which I started ages ago with a rather banal experiments, goes on and on and on now. Maybe it finishes somewhere, but it is interesting to observe that we have a modern means, modern quantum mechanics, which even predict that the things should be able to be done. And uh, with that, I leave you. Check my homepage in three years or four years or five years. Maybe then we have the paper about the purple uh, photon. This thing is published right now in the Journal for General Philosophy of Science. It's on now uh, in the net. Uh, and it took us years to get there. And um, what I invite you now to do is to look at the beginning of all this crazy story, which was Goethe's experiences in the snow. What you do here is you see um, the white, um, it, it's actually really a white um, screen, and we have one lamp here, which is um, pur purple because we have put some foil on it, and this represents the evening sun when Goethe came down the mountain. And then there's um, still hidden from here another lamp, which is just giving white light. 
and you have these two light sources. You have the purple light source and you have the white light source. And um, what it makes, the purple lits this moon here, or the sun, let's say, and you see it purple. And it creates at the same time a shadow on the screen, and the shadow is in beautiful green, right? And what you can do is you, you march into this field of light and you produce your own shadow, and you also check whether there's maybe a hidden green lamp there. I assure you there isn't, this is only this emergency exit nonsense, but uh, it is not strong enough to make this green. And we might, I, I guarantee you, if we, if we hit it, uh, you would still see this green shadow. So enjoy the great green shadow, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.